Hello and happy Friday Eve. It's Thursday, September 7th, and we have a jam-packed show, but only 10 minutes to do it, so let's get right to it. Keeping you on your toes today, so pop quiz, hot shot. One of the richest countries in Africa, what nation's capital is Libreville? Ghana, Gabon, Senegal, or Tanzania? Home to over 2 million people, the mostly French-speaking country of Gabon is the answer here. Let's learn a little bit about what's going on in Gabon now. The leader of Gabon's military, General Brice Naguema, was sworn in as interim president during a televised ceremony Monday. Last week, the general led a coup, or military takeover, that ousted President Ali Bongo. This takeover ended the previous family's power over many decades of rule over Gabon. The previous leader was in power for 14 years and was recently declared the winner of a disputed presidential election. There were voters voting delays, internet cuts, and the administration did not allow coverage of the vote by foreign press. After Bongo, the previous ruler, was ousted, he was placed on house arrest, and the new group in power voided the election results and shut the country's borders. And this has since triggered global condemnation of the coup. Celebrations also breaking out across the tiny nation and thousands of supporters expressed solidarity with the military. There was even a military parade for General Naguema's inauguration. No one knows how long Naguema will have power. He said the country will not rush into any new election so as to avoid a quote, repeat of past mistakes. CNN senior international correspondent, David McKenzie has more. I'm Ali Bongo Ondimba, president of Gabon. An extraordinary plea for international help. The ousted president of Gabon, Ali Bongo, under house arrest. To tell them to make noise, to make noise, for the people here have arrested me. The noise was not enough. On Monday, the new military leader sworn in. I solemnly undertake on my honor to do my utmost to achieve national unity, says Gabon's junta leader. National. Is there a fear that there is contagion happening here? Well, I don't think it's a fear of contagion. There is contagion. It's just the latest domino to fall. In just three years, a cascade of military takeovers spreading across West and now Central Africa. Most of them former French colonies but each with a specific cocktail of grievances over security, corruption, and a lack of opportunity. This is a wave who has, whose time has not yet crested. I think we're going to see uh, several more of these in the coming months and years before we see a kind of return to what we thought was a normal state in the kind of post-Cold War era. The condemnations have been universal. The impact, minimal. African and Western powers face a dilemma. In Niger, there is apparent popular support for the coup and deep anger towards France. Plans for a regional military intervention have stalled. French counter-terror forces have withdrawn from two of the countries. Their position in Niger is tenuous at best. At stake in Niger for the U.S., multi-million dollar drone bases critical in fighting extremist groups. The State Department is treading carefully. We continue to advocate for a diplomatic solution that respects the constitutional order uh, in Niger. In Gabon, state media showed off bags of cash. They say they were found at the son of the president's home and at the home of another official. CNN couldn't independently verify these images. For more than 50 years, Omar Bongo and his son Ali Bongo ran this oil-rich nation. Much of their wealth was kept in France. Most Gabonese, young and old, had only known the rule of the Bongo family and its cronies. So for them, the military coup in the short term looks much better than anything that they've been living through. And one can understand that boost of immediate support. And what the military and various missionary groups bring to the continent is less opportunities for freedom, for democracy, than more. David McKenzie, CNN, Johannesburg. 
And now let's talk about Venice, AKA the floating city, which has so much rich history, art, architecture, and charm that it can bring a sort of ebullience to many who visit. If anyone you know is thinking about making a day trip to the floating city, listen to this. Starting in the spring of 2024, if you're not spending the night, you'll have to fork over five euros, that's about $5.40, to get into the city on super busy days. The city is making history as the first in the world to charge folks an entry fee. This isn't a permanent thing, it's like a 30 day test run. And instead of doing it all in one month, they're picking days when they expect tons of visitors like holidays and the peak carnival season. The goal, to discourage day tourists during those crazy times. So here's the deal, Venice can get seriously crowded. On some days, there are way more tourists than actual residents. They're still working out the official dates when the fee will apply, but here's the scoop. For those who live there, commute, own a second home, or are staying overnight, you're off the hook. You'll just have to register online for your visit. The money they collect from these entry fees in part will help cover the costs of this booking system. And you know what? Other European cities dealing with hordes of day trippers are keeping a close eye on this test run in Venice. They're wondering if they too can pull off something similar to deal with the whole over tourism thing. Coming up, have you ever thought about how clean your place really is? I mean, even though it might look clean, what about those sneaky germs hiding where you can't really see them? Well, up next, CNN's Claire Duffy decided to roll up her sleeves and get down and dirty testing the germs in her home. And one more thing, I've always wondered, do we ever truly get rid of dirt and dust? Like if we wipe it up and toss it in the garbage or broom it away, it kind of just gets moved around, doesn't it? <laughs> Anyways, let's see what nasties might be lurking beneath the surface of our spaces. I want to know, was I the dirtiest? <laughs> it was a code, so we don't know who was who, but whoever's A was the least contaminated. Yes. <laughs> we set out on an experiment guided by food scientist Paul Dawson to collect samples from the homes of our colleagues, family, and friends to find out which spot in our homes has the most germs. Across five homes, we tested the same spots four days after they were cleaned. The kitchen sink drain, the kitchen countertop, the bathroom toilet seat, the bathroom faucet handles, and the front door entryway. The lab isolated bacterial cells and documented them as they multiplied, growing into colonies that we can see. This is really gross. <laughs> I mean, the front door one especially, it just looks, I mean, it's covered. Right. Like, I was really worried about when you walk in the front door, that ground, because we live in New York City and the ground is dirty. If you're really concerned about that, maybe having a doormat that you can clean periodically. Our non-scientific experiment confirmed decades of research. Microbes, including bacteria, live all around us. We're familiar with the dangerous ones like Salmonella, Listeria, and E. coli, plus viruses that we didn't test for. But not all germs are bad. In fact, most are just fine for us, and some help our bodies function. The thing that surprises people most about the germs in their homes is that the toilet seat is probably the cleanest place in their house. So the places where we prepare our food, those were dirtier than the toilet seat. I would say yes, definitely. The National Sanitation Foundation recommends using a weak bleach solution to sanitize kitchen drains and disposals once a month. For your sponge, try to replace it often. Across the board, the sponge is very highly contaminated with bacteria and mold. But, and that sponge, I replace my sponge every week, so that sponge was only three days old. Yeah, it's impossible to remove all the bacteria. They're gonna be there no matter what. The point is, most bacteria are uh, harmless or are positive. There's a few that aren't. That's where the sanitation would come in. The Danish Chamber Orchestra had some pretty unique performers at their recent gig. <laughs> A canine choir was howling at the moon, putting on a rare show featuring the Hunting Symphony, a piece composed by Leopold Mozart, who happens to be Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's dad, did you know? So here's the scoop. 10 dogs tried out for this gig, but only three made the cut. Cookie, Sophus, and Sika. These furry rock stars got picked because their barks sounded just about right and they could handle the loud music and the loud crowd. All right, we have a shout out to Mr. Mason, history teacher at Mayo in Mayo, Michigan. Your Miley submitted the winner of hashtag Your Word Wednesday. Ebullience, a noun meaning the quality of being cheerful and full of energy. Well done. I'm Coy Wire, and we'll see you tomorrow.